You have to be very careful about the information that you let in about complex PTSD and how to heal it because a lot of what people say about it is wrong. And I'll tell you why. Now, I'm talking about beliefs that people have about trauma and healing that are gonna misinform you and disempower you and hurt your chances of getting free from, from, from ever healing from this thing. And you can heal from it, all right? So in this video, I'm gonna tell you the five mistakes people make around their complex PTSD. And I'm gonna show you how to not make those mistakes, how to adopt a more, a more successful strategy that will help you get where you're trying to go. And by the way, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please hit that button. It really does help us here. Okay, number one mistake that you don't wanna make is don't make your CPTSD your identity, all right? The trauma in your life happened to you, but it is not you. You are not your trauma. You are a complete, full human being who had some bad stuff happen to you. And that stuff affected you and it caused an injury. But I'm gonna invite you to believe with all your heart that it's an injury and not an identity. And that healing, I want you to know this in your bones, healing is possible. It's possible for you to heal the brain changes that happen to you. It's possible for you to change the behavioral patterns that so many of us end up with after living a life with that brain injury. The brain injury produces something called dysregulation. Dysregulation makes it very hard for us sometimes to process information and emotions. They come in funny, they come out funny, and it complicates how we get educated. It complicates the way we have relationships. And we end up feeling really bad and like we're never gonna be okay, but you know what? You can become somebody who learns well. You can become somebody who has a good relationship because you are you, you are not your trauma. So my approach is to heal the symptoms caused by the trauma in the past. If you can take your focus and put it on the symptoms, then you've just taken one giant step towards disidentifying from your trauma. When I first started to heal, I was going to a 12-step program for families of alcoholics. And uh, technically, I am an adult child of an alcoholic. That is true. But I'm not really a child, and the alcoholic is, has not been alive for 30 years, so really I can't say that I'm affected by that directly anymore. I definitely was hurt as a kid, and that, I think that did cause some dysregulation and some attachment problems for me, and that all manifested as my CPTSD. So that happened. These things are real. But I was able to heal those symptoms without ever bringing my mom back to life. My mom died about the same month that I went to my first 12-step meeting and that I was also shown how to do this daily practice that helped me so much. You know, that's not a coincidence. Her, her dying prompted me to go get help for a lot of pain that I had about how it had been growing up and how uh, really neglected I had been and how much she had not been available to protect me from abuse from other family members because of her drinking. So my first six months or so going to meetings, I was crying every day, which is normal and healthy. I was telling my story. I was kind of waking up about the seriousness of stuff that had happened and remembering little incidents. And I'd hear other people sharing about it. And I was discovering, wow, I'm not alone. But I think it was at about six months. It was like, okay, you know, I really need to feel better now. now I had the good fortune back then to be shown two techniques that I call the daily practice. If you've watched any of my videos, I talk about them all the time. They help me so much, and that's why I'm always offering them to you. It's a free course. You can get that in the link just below this video in the description section. Daily practice, free course. Takes less than an hour to learn, but it's a writing and a meditation technique. And it saved my life. I, I learned another way to get my feelings, my negative feelings, like out of here, out of my heart, out of my mind and onto paper. Um, it very quickly became something that worked about 10 times better for me than the therapy I was doing. And eventually I quit therapy and I continued with this practice of writing. I needed something that I could do all the time. And so one of the benefits of the daily practice done all the time in my early recovery was that it helped me disidentify Instead of coming in and just being like, oh my gosh, you know, I just, this happened. You know, the year that I, the year that I got the daily practice, my mother died, my brother died. Uh, a, a person I loved more than anybody in the world ended the relationship with me. I was going through an extremely hard time and I needed somewhere for those feelings to go. Talking about it was making me feel worse. Dwelling on it was making me feel worse. Denying it wasn't even an option. It was so much for me to deal with. I was overwhelmed emotionally. 
And so then I had a technique where I could get it onto paper. And this is what I, you know, I've, I've taught now, I don't know, 30, 40,000 of people here through YouTube who have signed up for my free course teach it and I just get letters all day long that it's helped other people too. I don't know if it'll help you, but the one way that you can find out is to try it. It's very, very simple, very compatible with anything else you're doing. But it helps you to go, I have fear, I have resentment, you get it on paper and you stop identifying with that. It's not that you're denying your feelings, but you're not identifying with them anymore and you're not identifying with what happened to you. And when you have less fear and resentment about what happened to you, you know what comes in, more and more awareness of who you are now. Who you are now is the person who can actually like have fun, who can have relationships, who can earn money. Like you want to be you now. You, that's who you want to be is you now. And it just needs to be less painful to come into present time and get out of the memories and the fantasies of the future. You know, and fantasies can be negative too. You can be very afraid of the future. That's a fantasy. So getting caught up in, oh, the past was terrible, the future's dreadful. You can't be the person who has fun and is alive and makes money and moves around and eats peaches. I'm talking about peaches because today the, the ripe peaches came out and I'm just like, yay, my life just got like one notch better. I love peaches. Here now is where you want to be. You don't want to be identified with your trauma. You are not your trauma. Number two, don't give away your power to heal, okay? You're thinking, I don't give away my power to heal, but here's what I mean by that. I get letters all day long from people who are angry that people who hurt them haven't apologized, therapists they've seen have not figured out how to make them heal, uh, doctors they went to didn't understand trauma. Now, I am so sorry that this is a world where it's so hard to get understood as a person with CPTSD. And for right now, that is just a fact. You know, you go to the doctor, chances are small. They're, even if they say they know what it is, they probably don't. They, at least they're beginning to do like these little tiny trainings for people. But what they teach them may not include stuff that's relevant to you. For example, dysregulation. Like so few clinical professionals know really what dysregulation is. Not just emotional dysregulation, but nervous system dysregulation that is really like the root cause of almost every symptom. When they notice that we say, oh yeah, no, I'll definitely quit smoking. I know it's bad for me. And then we fail to do it. See, they think we don't care, <laughs> but actually we're too dysregulated and stuff like cigarettes and a lot of addictions actually are ways that we can temporarily hold on to a little bit of regulation, even though in the end it sabotages dysregulation. I know that's why I smoke two packs a day. By the way, I have this sheet that you can download and give your doctor and it says it's called 12 things I wish my doctor understood about CPTSD. I'm gonna throw that link down in the description section too so you have that. Um, I think a lot of people have found that helpful and you know it's really exciting more than a thousand doctors have downloaded it. I'm very psyched about that. You just have to have patience with the world right now. You're the one who's forging ahead like a pioneer to learn about what this thing is and once you hear the symptoms and you go that is what I have, you're the pioneer. You're going to have to turn around and educate people around you and half of them are not going to want to know. A lot of um, clinicians are going to feel challenged or threatened because you think you know what's wrong with you. I wouldn't even bother like if you can possibly get to the really cool doctors and therapists who are like, yeah, I want to know what it is. Yeah, you read something helpful. Tell me what it is. I would like to know more. <laughs> That's a good doctor, by the way. People who want to know more, who don't consider themselves to already know everything there is to know. And especially when it comes to CPTSD. Those of us who have it have a unique perspective and we need to be at the table when people are trying to figure out like what to do about CPTSD. So I just found a lot of like formal programs out there. They do many things well, but it tends to be more the things that are obvious or that you can see from the outside. And they don't understand the sort of inner workings. And the key thing that I often don't see is the dysregulation of just understanding how when, when a person with CPTSD gets dysregulated, like triggered and upset, the reasoning goes down. There's this temporary inability to really think straight and a temporary intense emotional feeling. It comes back and we can train ourselves to kind of keep it in balance. So that's what we're doing here. So when I say don't give away your power to heal, I mean don't waste all your energy on 
being mad at the world for not understanding you because you've just given them your your power like come on world heal me come on doctor why haven't you healed me come on well, this therapist they didn't get me at all well they can't all right that information about what we have is only beginning to be published everyone with cptsd who heals from cptsd is going to have an opportunity to communicate effectively and change this consciousness you know in, in 10 20 years this could be a very different thing <laughs> and maybe then I can retire. <laughs> but until then, I'm teaching and teaching and teaching. Like, this is what it feels like to have it. This is what is known about it. And I'm not the end all be all of what's known about it. I try to keep up with things. But mostly, I'm a person who has it, who's learned how to treat it in myself. I treat myself as sovereign. Sovereign means the queen or king, in your case, perhaps. I am the sovereign of my own healing. And I hire help from consultants such as doctors, therapists. I don't do therapy anymore, but I would if I, if I thought it, would, it was a good idea in any particular thing. Um, I hire their professional help to help me with a project of healing that I'm in charge with. This is my ship, I'm the captain. And if something's not working for me, I stop. And if I'm curious about something, I try it, I ask questions but I take charge of that. And the reason I've had a lot of success finding what works for me is because I tried a thousand things. I tried and tried and tried. I tried many things that weren't helpful to me. I tried a lot of things that are very helpful to other people, but not for me. I used to just feel terrible, like, what's wrong with me? It's like, nothing's wrong with me. We're each a little different. The way we manifest our CPTSD is a little different. This is not a perfectly measured science yet. We learn what works for us by trying, and we you know, learn to do that in a boundaried way. And so stick around this channel to keep learning. Like, how do you do that? How do you keep learning how you can identify your triggers, how you can calm them down? And you will be amazed at how much power you actually have to make your life change because you develop the ability to calm your triggers. Your triggers are what empower every bad thing about CPTSD. They make you get dysregulated. They make you get disconnected. They make you act out with self-defeating behaviors. Triggers are the problem. So if you can start to notice, whoops, here I go, I'm getting triggered. Stop, I'm not gonna say stuff. I'm gonna refrain from trying to solve a problem when I'm triggered and dysregulated. I'm gonna get myself re-regulated and then I'm gonna proceed. I kid you not, you can change the course of your life by using tools to catch yourself when you're triggered, get re-regulated, and then proceed. And everyone, everyone will be grateful to you for that change in you. They might, they might pressure you in the moment like, oh, this is such a nuisance having you, you have to get re-regulated. Yeah, well, don't listen. They really, you know, they'll, they'll realize soon enough that they didn't really like the dysregulated you. But you're gonna have so much more success in anything you try to do, whether it's to keep healing yourself, to be creative, to make money, to have a family, like all the things that you might be desiring in your heart to do start to become accessible to you when you have mastery over, over your dysregulation. That comes from you being sovereign, all right? It's very unlikely somebody's gonna just like plop that in your lap. It, you can heal whether or not your insurance covers treatment. You can heal whether or not you have help, professional help. You can heal whether or not the professional help you have is with people who understand it. You can heal. You can do this. So that's number two. Keep your power. You own this. This is your healing. The third mistake that people make about CPTSD, not to make, don't keep talking and talking and talking about the past. Now, isn't that funny? Because for basically the last hundred years, people who had emotional or psychological problems were told, you need to talk about it. Do you have someone to talk to? Why don't you talk to somebody good about that? That is just common sense advice. We were all raised on it. So what happens if, like me, you ended up finding that when you do go talk to somebody about it, you don't get better. And in fact, you start to feel really upset and stressed when you try to talk about it. Well, now we know. That is not true for everybody, but with CPTSD, it's fairly common. And it's dysregulation, once again, it's dysregulation triggered by talking about trauma. And that's how trauma works. When trauma is lingering in your nervous system, yes, it can be triggered and set off. It can be set off by uh, seeing something, smelling something, right? Hearing something, and it can be set off by talking about it, revisiting the memory. And it turns out that talking about a memory uses a certain pathway in the brain, and somewhere on that pathway is that little trigger. But 
it's possible for you to communicate what happened to you, to visit it, communicate it, share it with another person. You can do that without talking about it by writing about it and then reading what you wrote. All right. James Pennebaker at University of Texas, Austin has done decades of research on this. He was doing it not necessarily about trauma, but about the therapeutic value of writing. And it's surprisingly powerful when people are writing about thoughts that bother them. Well, here at Crappy Childhood Fairyland, we use a specific writing technique called the daily practice and it's specific. And the specific technique involves writing fearful and resentful thoughts asking for them to be removed and then following it with meditation. And I just want to say, this is very different. It's very different than talking. All right. It's very different than journaling. Journaling is about recording those thoughts. The techniques we use are about discarding those thoughts. They're about getting them on paper so you can stop thinking them, get rid of them, trusting that anything that you actually need to remember or do or respond to that's visiting your fears today is going to come back to you. Your mind is merely going to get clearer, not blank, not empty, just clearer. So that a lot of the free floating anxiety and things you don't actually need to worry about, they poof, they evaporate. Some things you do need to worry about like, wow, I forgot to make my follow up appointment at the dentist. I've got to do that or things that are even more crucial. So when you have a clear mind, that's not all cluttered up with fear and resentment, you can remember better. You can prioritize better. You can even make a conscious decision about how you will use your mind in a given moment. Like that's really weird. The first time that happened to me, I didn't even recognize it. But basically when you're dysregulated and CPTSD has hold of your thinking, you're never really in charge of what you're thinking about. You know, you're trying to use it. Somebody says here, you know, fill out this worksheet and you go, okay. And you start doing it, but very quickly your mind is wandering or you're sitting in a group of people and people are having a discussion and you're listening to them, but very quickly your mind is wandering. And usually it's going inside to fearful, resentful thoughts. What does she mean by that? Hey, these guys are friends. I think these people all have plans for lunch and they didn't invite me. So these little hamsters on the hamster wheel are just going, going, going. And you can barely or partially only pay attention to what's going on around you. And that's going to limit your happiness. It's going to limit your effectiveness and participation in life. Instead of talking about that trouble, you take it to the paper. Now I love these techniques because they involve a pen and a paper and in so many settings, there is nothing weird about sitting there writing on a pad of paper. You can do it in the theater. You can do it in the office. You can do it on a train. Nobody bats an eye. You're not just standing on your head or doing some funny eye catching technique. You're just doing something that nobody notices. But privately what you're doing is you're releasing a bunch of fearful and resentful thoughts that are cluttering your perception so that you can think clearly, you can have lucidity, you can have calmness. Those are the fruits of when you stop talking, talking, talking about your trauma. Now I don't want to knock it. It is necessary to talk sometimes about your trauma. It's so important to tell your story in whatever form you decide to tell it. Almost everybody's healing begins with acknowledging what happened and telling at least one other person. This is what happened to me. Some people write a book. Some people join a group. Some people go tell a therapist. Some people finally tell a spouse. It's all good that we do it sometimes, but it's just that when it goes on and on and on, it can be fruitless. It's not the way that all of your healing is going to come. And I think that in a lot of cases for the last however many decades, therapy has been set up on the assumption that if you could just keep talking about it, you would, you would eventually have a breakthrough. And I assume a lot of people have had that breakthrough or else there wouldn't even be therapy. I mean, it's so prevalent. It's still so it's like what insurance pays for when you need help. So there must be something to it. But for me going and talking about my trauma, doesn't help me process anything. It like sort of freezes up my ability to process information. I remember, you know, the therapist would write down some goals we wrote down that I, this week I'm going to something, 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 something. See, I can't even remember because when I'm dysregulated, I can't form memories. I really can't use any good thing that happened in there. And mostly I would just go in there and cry and the distress would accelerate and accelerate and amplify. The more I talked about it, the more upset I got. And good, good therapists tried to figure that out and make the most of it and help me. And eventually I would always just quit. You know, I'd give it a try two years here, four years there, 11 different therapists, but I just, it was just the same every time. And finally I learned, finally I learned. I, first I learned this technique to write my fears and resentments and it worked. And then I learned the science about why that might be that writing about trauma and reading what you wrote to a buddy or somebody who also does this, 
That's something you'll learn in my course, in my free course. If you can read it to somebody, you can get relief in any time. You know, you, you don't have to wait for a weekly appointment. You have relief at your fingertips. You can have this pad of paper in your purse all the time, pen and paper, you know, just with you all the time. Folded up paper in your back pocket. You always have it. You can have it by the bed. You can have it in the car. Pull over and discharge those, those triggered feelings that are coming out. And that is how you can calm your triggers. So that's why I say don't keep talking, talking, talking about trauma, about bad memories from the past. You can use a mix of methods, part talking, but also part writing, maybe some somatic body type things. A lot of people use exercises, yoga, dance, martial arts. There are many ways to relieve your dysregulation. You can learn about those on my website at crappychildhoodfairy.com. Number four, don't use isolation to control your triggers. A lot of us end up doing that. If it's not like complete isolation where we go off and be a hermit, we find a way to keep everybody at arm's length. Don't do that. You need other people to heal, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because if you have CBTSD, one of the most difficult things is needing people. Dealing with people and all the dynamics there can be so triggering and so expensive for us. It can cost days of dysregulation just to have a little friction with somebody. And so it's like a prison. If you end up using isolation to keep that dysregulation at bay, yes, it's a temporary fix, but so many of us have ended up isolating through years. And you know what happens when you isolate all the time? You get a little bit weird, okay? <laughs> Take it from someone who knows. It's really important to stay connected to people, even though it's hard. And how you can do that is take it a little at a time, a little at a time. You don't have to throw yourself in and join this deep club that meets every day. <laughs> You can do a little at a time and use short things. If connecting with people is something you need to develop a little bit, I do have a course for that, the Connection Bootcamp. So I keep plugging courses, but they're all down. I'll put all the links down there so you can find some support for that there. But you don't want to stay isolated as a way to control your triggers. What you want to do is learn to control your triggers whether you're around people or not. That's your freedom. If you know that you can control your triggers, you're going to find very quickly that you have true social mobility. You can go to a party if you want because you know if it starts to just get totally awful for you, you know what to do. You have tools to deal with it and stay or you can leave. You don't have to get so completely jammed up and paralyzed with fear about how am I going to deal with it. I better not go. So those days are over for you now. You have freedom because you have tools, all right? Number five, don't try to make other people control your triggers for you, all right? Don't give them that power. The, what you want to do instead is you control your triggers and then you have freedom to hang out with anybody you like. It's so tempting because it feels like when you are triggered and when you have PTSD, it seems so much that other people are causing the trigger. So let's say you go on a couple of dates with somebody and they say they're going to call and they don't call and you go into a great big abandonment depression over it. Then when they do call a day later, a day later than they said they would call, you're raging at them. Well, and then they don't want to go out with you. What just happened there is you're making somebody else responsible for your trigger. That, that rage feeling or that panic or that abandonment depression that came from somebody not calling when they said they would, I totally know what it's like. It's very intense and severe. But it's CPTSD. It's not actually caused by the other person. So you could, if they would continue to see you after that behavior, which they probably might not, but if they were, it would also be tempting to say, don't ever not call when you said you were going to call. We've dated two times and by now you owe me this like commitment to call when you say you're going to call. Well, it doesn't work. It's an attempt to control other people. But worst of all, it's outsourcing the responsibility to not get triggered. And no matter how much other people try not to trigger you, it ain't going to work. It's not going to happen. They can't really control whether we get triggered because if it's not the, you know, calling you when they said they were going to call, it's going to be something else. If you're just sitting there like a ticking time bomb of triggers, sooner or later it's going to go off. And you know what? Good, loving, healthy people, they don't want to get in trouble just for, you know, being who they are. Nobody wants to be criticized for being who they are. So your job in dating is A, to work on your triggers and keep them calm and then B, Pay attention to the way people treat you. If somebody not calling when they say they will is a bummer for you, then maybe you don't, don't want to go out with that person. I wouldn't go and like tear them a new one over it because you just met them. 
You're always going to get better results when the triggered part is something that you own and you take responsibility for. And the connecting with other people part is where you're not giving them responsibility to keep you untriggered. You can ask them to meet you halfway on things that you want in the relationship. You absolutely can. You get to have boundaries, but you don't give away the power to trigger you or not trigger you. Yes, there are a few exceptions. Let's say somebody has a spider phobia. Could they not just put tarantulas in your face? <laughs> okay, I think that's a reasonable way of saying, could you not trigger me? I have one. I have like a deal breaker thing. I say, I, you cannot tickle me. I, I was tickle tortured as a kid, like to an extreme degree, and I can't stand being tickled. And I kid you not, if, if somebody tries to tickle me and it's been a long time, but if they do, I can almost not control my impulse to like punch, kick you know, to fight it like the worst thing. If anybody's close to me, they know darn well, do not tickle me, not cool. You get to have exceptions to that. If you're not subscribed to this channel yet, hit that button. I would love to have you as a regular subscriber and it really helps me and it helps the channel so that I can keep giving you fresh videos every week. If you like this topic about how to optimize your healing for childhood PTSD and get the most out of it, I invite you to watch this video right here. It's one of my favorites. This video up here is the one YouTube thinks you're going to like best. You can tell me in the comments which one was best for you. And I'll see you very soon.